Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Welcome to Drinking Bros, kids. We got a we got a very special episode today. Would you say Ooh. Would you say that it's special, Dan? Yeah. How important is Ephraim Matos? Well, Ephraim. Is it Ephraim? Ephraim. Ephraim. Yeah. I, don't, I never say it like that. And Ephraim, 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 yeah. Ephraim. There's a thousand different I ways to say I always say it, Fram. Yeah. I go a hard I Fram saying, on that. What's Ephraim. weird is yeah. to see a ginger white kid with the name Ephraim. Yeah. yeah and, and a Portuguese last name. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah That's yeah. me, man. Super strange all the way around. Super, super diverse. That's uh, are me. you sure your parents are who they say they are? I'm not sure. No. But hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> no, they definitely aren't pretty much exactly like them. <laughs> so you train seals. Yeah. Or, or, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I did. Yeah. Or you were, you, or you were one, right? You I were, was one, and then maybe train them, yeah. and then you train them, and then you right. went on a, a worldwide circus tour. Exactly. That that's pretty much sums me up. <laughs> no. I, so look, full disclosure here, obviously, because I'm, I'm a civilian. Dan said, "Hey, man, I got this guy who's lived this crazy fucking life, and it would be one of the wildest podcast episodes ever. We should have him on the show. I'm always down." Um, you guys know each other. How did you? How do you guys know each other? I just, uh, Hamity. Yeah, Hamity just put really? us in yeah. contact. Yeah, no shit. Shout out we to love him. Him, we, by the yeah. way. I mean, obviously, oh, yeah, he's awesome. Whenever we meet anybody in the military community, we always there's six degrees of separation somehow. Like we know four or five of the same people typically every single yeah. time. And, yeah. and by the way, I want to tell the audience this because they don't they don't know this. Look, they hear the show Drinking Bros, or they look at the logo or see us fucked up somewhere. But before it starts, and, and to Dan's point, like this is what happens. I didn't know. It seems like you guys were lifelong mm. friends. Mm. The way you guys were chatting in the kitchen, we're all standing around drinking scotch. The um, uh, the most powerful bond you'll ever make in your life are over trauma, and there are very few things as physically and psychologically traumatic than being in war for an extended period of time. Yeah, because right. it, it seemed like you guys were all bro. And your one of your beef fries is here over yeah, here. Matt. We, yeah, <laughs> give him a shout out real quick, Matthew Hunter. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the three, the way the three of you guys were talking, I thought you guys were all best friends for life. And I was like, <laughs> oh, Jesus, I'll give him a moment, you know, but that's not the case. Well, there's something about a dude that's been through similar training and experience as you that like you immediately know a lot about that person without actually knowing anything about them personally. Like there, look, there are a bunch of different types of uh, personality in the military from even in the grunt and special operations communities. There's a lot of different varying types of personality, but there's key things that are pretty similar about yeah. all of us. Like we all had the same stupid haircut. Most of us grow beards when we get out. Uh, think that like those are that's a joke. But we're matching like, hats. Is it a know, trend? Is, let me yeah. ask you this: Is the beard a trend? <laughs> I think I, I don't remember it. Be- I, beards are like lazy. Yeah. So in the military, you're supposed to keep your you know your beards and everything close cropped, and uh, so that I think it's just kind of a rebellion thing. But then also in the special operations world, and guys working in different. Um, Places like Afghanistan, everybody's growing out the beard, so it's kind of a cool guy thing to do. Oh, and I just, gotcha. it, but it's also kind of like, yeah, rebellious. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're yeah. done. You're like, I'm done shaving. Well, and, and also, if I don't shave, I look like a 14 year old girl. So it's yeah, really bad. Yeah, it's bad. You look like a real young guy. Yeah, yeah. For all the shit you were talking about before we came on the show, I was like, dude, that guy's way too young to have lived this life already. How old are you? 27. Holy shit. Yeah, I'm a baby. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so how'd you how'd you get into it? How'd you? For what made you want to enter the military, first of all? Because I, I always find this answer fascinating. Yeah, well, I had a, I had a weird childhood. I grew up in um, I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Part I of love like a, Milwaukee, by the way. Oh, which, really? Which neighborhood? Nice. I grew up in um, Menominee Falls area, but mm-hmm. then also um, just right up, right next to the airport. Oh, cool, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I like I love Milwaukee. It's like the same. as you, you, you like Pittsburgh, right? Yeah. Milwaukee is like Midwestern Pittsburgh, basically. A lot of the Small cities are the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's dope, and there's... The best thing about Milwaukee is that no matter what time of day it is, somebody's drinking. Yeah. <laughs> like there's a bre- but yeah, man, there's a beer bre- there, man. Yeah. yeah. There's a brewery yeah. that's open from probably, I don't know, nine AM until two AM. That's the way it should be. Yeah. That's the way it should be. Milwaukee it's America. Brewers. Yeah, yeah man. It's a lot of lot of babies and bars there too, just in Wisconsin in general. <laughs> 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 like you could tell like a, a typical mom has a kid and during the pregnancy they don't really drink much or at all. And then for the first year or two of the baby's life, they don't really drink much at all. But in Wisconsin, as soon as that baby's out, they hand you a pint. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Drink this. You need it. It's like getting to the top of a hill and somebody hands you a cup of water in a marathon or some shit. Like, oh, thanks. 
Yeah. Because these people are lifelong alcoholics. I appreciate how dedicated they are to drinking every single day. Yeah. That's the, <laughs> that's the point of my positive rant about Wisconsin. So your mom drank with you as a child? Well, no. So that's where I was going with this. So I, <laughs> I grew up super weird. Uh, I grew up in like a fundamentalist Christian uh, Same. Like household, Tended too. so there was yeah, there was no, there was no, was, no, was, bows, was, well, no music, yeah, no music. Yeah. Girls had to wear like uh, skirts and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, couldn't go to movie theaters. My, my dad told what, us. What, what were you? What was your Pentecostal? Pentecostal. Yeah. I was a fundamental Baptist. It's the same. Yeah, pretty More much less, the same yeah. thing. Yeah, like it's don't smoke, drink, or do anything. Like don't hug full frontal. I, I heard the phrase from my <laughs> one of my very no first hugging. girlfriends. This woman I dated for two years when I was a junior and senior in high school. Her dad. Use the phrase full frontal hug. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like excuse me? What, is yeah. that, what does that mean? Like, that's, you, do you want me to hug her from the back? Yeah. Like, what are you talking about? He goes, no, your, your whole fucking body was connected. I'm like, that's what a hug is, dude, is it? Yeah, like, when I hug a dude, I don't fucking jut my ass out to keep back. my dick from touching his dick. In Georgia, growing up in well, the South, they always say make room for Jesus. Leave room for Jesus. Oh, that's during okay. the dances. So yeah, like, yeah. All right, cool, man. Yeah. You got to yeah. be far, far enough away. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Leave room for Jesus. <laughs> To hop on in there. At any rate, yeah, fundamentalist. Up yeah, in yeah. Home. So that's how I grew up. You know what? No alcohol, nothing like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just, I just, I kind of had this uh, desire to, I don't know, it's super idealistic. Wanted to serve my country. Wanted to fight um, bad guys. And my my dad was in the Air Force Reserve, so he flew, you know, C one thirties and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So I was always around military type stuff. And um, in two thousand three, he was, you know, he went over to Iraq and was, uh, you know. Uh, transport and stuff with the C-130s and all that stuff, moving troops in and out and evacuating casualties and all that stuff. So it was, it was always something that was kind of, you know, uh, a very, very close part of our mm-hmm. of our family. Um, but yeah, so then when I was um, senior in high school, I was like, well, let's let's go do the SEAL thing and um, signed up. Didn't have a clue what I was getting myself into, but I was just was like, man, I want to go do that. And uh, How fucking hard yeah. is it really? Man, I... I, I don't really have anything else to compare it to because that's the only thing that I ever did. But I mean, dude, I mean, it's it's a kick. It's a kick in the nuts. It's just, but for months and months and months and months, it's like just getting kicked in the nuts. How long does it last? Uh, well, the the initial selection portion of it is, is six months. That's basic underwater demolition SEAL training called BUDS. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's during that six months is pretty much where you're weeding everybody out. Um, I mean, it's like, you know, 90% attrition rate. But it's mostly guys, most of the guys just quit because it's, it's not. It's it's not technically that difficult to do. Nothing they're asking you to do is is impossible, but it's so beyond miserable and it just doesn't end. That mm. and it's so painful that guys just <clears throat> they 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 give up and they don't want to do anymore. Uh, it's usually because man, you're you're chafing because you're always wet and sandy. Um, you're freezing. Guys are getting hypothermia during not, uh, yeah, at night, and then during the day you're having guys pass out from heat, heat cats, exhaustion. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's it's everything, um, and you're just. You know, basically, what, what what's unique about the about seal selection though too is the for the first you know seven weeks of it until you until you make it through hell week, you're not learning any skills, right? So like if you go to like ranger school or SF selection, you're like carrying a rock and you got your <laughs> rifle and you're going from point A to point B, and there's kind of a skill set there. Um, it, it's miserable, don't get me wrong, but it's, there's kind of a skill set that you're using with uh, seal selection. It's just seven weeks. All they're doing is torturing you. You learn you learn literally zero skills. All they do is just torture you for seven weeks, and at the end of that is the culmination. That's that's hell week. I mean, dude, it's, it's like I said, I don't have anything else to compare it to, but I mean, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's just, it's like just getting kicked in the nuts over and over and over again. <laughs> and the reason I ask, like you read about a guy like Dan Bilzerian, for example, it's mm-hmm. just like, oh yeah, you know, I was, it was going to be a seal. And I, yeah. One uh, 1024th Navy seal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that, is that that's what an Elizabeth is? Warren <laughs> that's joke? A, that's right an Elizabeth there. Warren joke. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, but, but, um, that's high, kind that's of what high, it is, right? That's highbrow comedy, Ross. Yeah, no, I, I get it. Look, I'm, I'm Pocahontas, you know. Until I die here, I understand. Well, until yeah. March 4th when she's <laughs> yeah, out of the race. Yeah, until she's out after Super Tuesday, <laughs> yeah. and that's fine. But um, but you, you read a guy like Dan Bilzerian who's, mm-hmm. you know, oh, yeah, I was going through buds and something happened, right? Yeah. And you're like, yeah, where are you? I mean, I'm sure thousands of people went through buds and didn't fucking well, make well, it. Yeah, it's, I mean, an 80, it's literally an 87% attrition rate. 87% of the people who show up don't make it. Yeah, and that and that doesn't even include the guys. Once you do make it through, but and, and all. then you've got to go, and, th- and then you've still got six more months of actual learning yeah. to be a seal, and then you actually get your tried in and get assigned to a team. And then and there's a lot of stuff months that can before you in deploy. That period, right? oh, Jesus it's, it's three and a half years. Like it's that, three and a half. Years. That second yeah. six month the training phase, there's a lot of stuff you can, you can still get peered out by your team members, and oh, like, yeah. there's all sorts of oh, stuff yeah. that can happen to get you dropped. So eighty seven percent of the people who show up sometime within the first seven weeks are gone. 
Mm-hmm. That's basically. crazy, man. And then after that, you're still probably going to lose 10 to 15% of the yeah. guys who make it through Hell Week and all that jazz. But, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, you have a guy like uh, Dan Bilzerian. I mean, I, 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 I'm not familiar with it exactly what, like how far he got into Hell Week or whatever. But, uh, yeah, I mean, but, but it, is, it actually is very real where you have guys that, I mean, are tough dudes um, that would have made it, but I mean, you get injured, man. It's not, it's not a, it's not a joke when you go through that. I mean, guys are pulling, you know, muscles, and you're. You, you got to be at one hundred percent, I would yeah, imagine, to make it through something like that, right? Well, you don't have to be at one hundred percent, but there are there are places where okay. So if you're if it's if it's life, limb, or eyesight, they'll mm-hmm. pull you from training. Mm-hmm. But if it's not, if you're not literally going to die or lose a limb or lose your eyesight, you continue on. So for example, when I when I went through Hell Week, the first night of Hell Week, I got a herniated disc. Mm-hmm. It was just bulging; it didn't rupture. Um, excruciatingly painful. I still had five more days to go, and you're carrying at a minimum 40 to 50 pounds on you running at all times, 24 hours a day. Um, and Are you sleeping? You get four. You get a total of four hours of sleep. Four quote after, unquote and, a, and, a, and uninterrupted hours, which is never true, right? Well, no, they, no, they, no, they let us. They let us uh, for four straight hours. They just no, no, it was, it was two hours on like Wednesday afternoon, and then like two hours on Thursday. So they, they keep you up for <laughs> well, they keep you up for ninety six <laughs> hours, and a, after ninety six hours, like I, from what I understand from a medical point of view, I guess you start uh, getting brain damage or something after like ninety six hours. So they medically have to let you stop for two yeah. hours, and you lay there for two <clears> hours. I don't remember sleeping. At all i was just i was in so much pain um after then, 19 consecutive hours it, just 19 that's not even no, a full 96 day. i know but after oh, yeah, after no. 19 consecutive hours you're you you have the same blood alcohol or you had the same cognitive abilities as someone with a bac of 0.04 which is half the legal limit after just oh, 19 gosh, yeah. after I did not just 19 hours yeah i, I can believe that yeah, i wrote crazy i yeah. wrote a whole fucking paper like a white paper on this when i was in the army when i was on cq one night i'm like Doing 24 hours of straight duty is fucking stupid. <laughs> you guys got to figure something out. Like, and I explained scientifically why it doesn't work. And I just like passed out a bunch of copies. And they're like, get fucked, asshole. Got to change the system from the inside. No, um, I just, no, I was just bored. Yeah, I hear so you. So you, you powered through it. 96 yeah. hours is a long goddamn time. As a yeah, that. yeah, dude, yeah. that's fucking brutal. And, and so they, they give you two hours. And of course, everybody cramps up. You, your, your face swells, your hands swell, you know, like you, your feet swell to the point where guys, you know, toenails are popping off. Um, and then they, you know, wake you up after those two hours and you immediately it's, you know, keep in mind you're, you're completely chafed right under your armpits, between your legs, all that around your neck. Mm -hmm. It's just like, it's like raw hamburger from all the sand and cause you're constantly running. So it just chafes you up and then they immediately make you jump into the ocean, which is just a bunch of freezing cold salt water. So it's, um, that was the one point in training where I saw, I would say at least half a dozen guys just weeping cause it was that first time you're doing flutter kicks in the fucking, in the water. The, the first time? Like, th- th- that's when people start dropping out. When they get into the water after fucking oh, getting dude, that first rest. Dude, you want to know what's crazy is... No, no. Like, at that point, we had reached the point where nobody quit anymore. Okay. So we had guys literally in tears, but they weren't going to quit because they had already kind of uh, passed Past that point. threshold. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They, they see if you see... The, the saying is, if you see sunlight on Wednesday morning uh, in, in Hell Week, you'll make it. Um, or, mm. like, at that point, you, we know you're not going to quit kind of thing. Got it. Yeah. So, yeah, did that whole deal. Um, Do you get a break yeah. after that? Like, what happens the day after? Like, hey, man, oh, congratulations, you made it through Hell Week. What happens? You get to go sleep for, like, three days? Uh, no, you got to wake up the next morning and do a medical check. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you you, you pass out. Uh, we, had, we had a couple guys actually spent uh, the night or a couple nights in the hospital because as soon as they secured Hell Week, two guys in my class just, literally just collapsed and went unconscious. So their mind was just keeping them going. And as soon as we got the signal, you know, the, the one phrase was Hell Week secured, mm-hmm. and they were like they had an American flag. And as soon as, uh, as soon as we saw that, two guys actually just passed out and got taken right to the hospital. Um, but yeah, so the next morning you get up and then they, they do more medical checks on you because everybody's messed up. Everything's swollen. Um, they're checking you for infections. I mean, guys, I mean, I, like I said, I had a herniated disc. I couldn't even like sit up. I had to like roll out of bed and all that stuff. Um, and a lot of guys are sick and just different stuff. But, uh, but yeah, then you get uh, Saturday afternoon off and Sunday off and Monday morning it's back to work. Fuck. So yeah, <laughs> back to training. And, but, that, but that week after Hell Week, it's a lot of pool work. So they're having you um, like drown proofing and shit, or like the um, initial... not, not drown proofing, but they'll do um, uh, they do uh, what is it uh, life saving. So this the seal instructors are in the water, and it's actually a way for them to get rid of guys. This is a secret they don't tell you. Uh, it's a it's a it's a way to get rid of guys who wouldn't quit, mm-hmm. who they like absolutely hated, but for whatever reason they didn't quit, and for whatever reason they didn't you know hit the hit the notches to where they could get rid of them. Mm-hmm. What they'll do is they'll basically just drown you during life saving and and fail you. For it so no I we had, shit. yeah so we had several guys one guy in my bow crew 
um, was I was with him all of Hell Week, and for whatever reason, I honestly don't understand why, because I thought he was a pretty good dude, yeah. but the instructors absolutely hated him. Apparently, he'd been to Bud's before, and the, the other guys didn't like him um, from his previous class. And so they, they were harassing him and my boat crew the entire time, trying to get us to force him to quit. Uh, and I, you know, I, I wasn't getting involved in any of that. But um, yeah, so right after we finished Hell Week, he goes to uh, Life Saving and they just basically borderline drown him. And they're like, oh, you failed. You didn't save the, you didn't save the, uh, the distressed swimmer, which is, of course, <laughs> a seal with, with flippers and, and, a, and a snorkel and a mask and everything. And yeah, it's a, yeah. It's That's nuts. crazy. Yeah, it's it's gnarly, man. It's you just, you have no idea if you're gonna be there the next day. It's every day is like that, and it so goes how, like that for months. When you were uh, you were on Team One, right? Yeah. So did you do any Middle East deployments, or did you do deployments primarily to Southeast Asia and shit like that? I, I did. I luckily my first deployment, I got to go to Afghanistan. Oh, that's so, good. Yeah, the, the previous policy had been that they were sending Team One only to Southeast Asia. Right. Um, well, I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot of Al Qaeda in the Southern Islands and stuff like that, and mm-hmm. doing it's they're they're. They're involved in the international drug trade quite a bit. Like it's a port for stuff to come hither and there and all that stuff. There's a lot going on down there. The previous government had an agreement before this new guy in the Philippines that wants to murder drug dealers. Right. The previous government was like, hey, if you Al Qaeda guys just stay on the southern islands, we're not going to fuck with you. But if you come up here, we're going to like there's Green Berets and SEALs there all the time doing mm-hmm. shit. If you just stay on the southern islands and leave us out of it, we'll leave you alone. But now this new guy is fucking crazy. Mm-hmm. He wants to fight everybody all the time, so we'll see. Like, I, it's still developing at this point. We don't know where, like, what the conflict in the Philippines is going to look like between first group and SEAL Team One, and f- like three, four years from now, it, it could get real messy down there. Mm-hmm. People forget of the Philippines is even a thing. A lot. Oh, yeah, I forget people, about it all the time. Well, people forget all about the Philippines. Yeah, yeah. but there's so like, much. Oh, yeah, Philippines. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's so guys, much poverty yeah. there, and they keep getting hit with these bigger and bigger natural disasters. Stuff is going to go fucking way far left over there soon like it's gonna get weird as shit i'm sure hmm. i'm sure it's only a matter of time so yeah, your first deployment was to afghanistan yep got to do that which was uh that was great so we were th- i was there in uh 2014 right during the retrograde they were we were pulling all the troops oh, out God, so that was, sucks yeah it was with one of the one of the last seal platoons that was out there it was the last There's a lot of blue on green violence and yeah there was tons of stuff happening yeah going on because because the uh, the afghanis i mean they, they knew our, our partner force they knew we were leaving them mm-hmm. and so they were stealing stuff they were siphoning they would literally go to the vehicles the night before a mission and would siphon out the, the fuel gas. yeah they'd siphon mm-hmm. out the fuel sell it out on the black market and the next morning we'd you know get in the vehicles to go you know hit a target or go do a patrol or whatever and then all of a sudden you know one of the vehicles would die and we're like you got to be freaking kidding me you yeah. know, because they were they were selling ammo. So that was another thing too. We'd get into these gnarly gunfights, um, real bad, real bad Taliban controlled areas, and then uh, it, you you could see it on our helmet cam footage. The Afghani's, a lot of them, they're just sitting there. They would literally they would literally sit down in the middle of an ambush, like they'd just get into a ditch, sit there, and uh, yeah, we're just we're in this gnarly gunfight. And then after that, they're like, hey, we need we need more ammo. We used up all of our ammo on the fight. You know, and they're going to use that ammo and sell it out on the black market. Yeah, yeah. Out you, did town. you point it out to them in the footage? of like, hey, man, let me show you the replay of this. Yeah, our our, our officers and, and chiefs were were on top of all that, and they were like, no, nah, man, like they wouldn't even let me uh, give them batteries because I was a, I was a comms guy as well, mm. uh, and um, yeah, so the, they were coming to me like, oh, we need more batteries, we need more batteries, and I'm like, dude, you don't need, you know, you don't need more batteries. Yeah, because um, you know you can use batteries to make IEDs or whatever else yeah, you want to yeah, do. Bombs, so whatever. Yeah, it's it was. It was insanity, and then we actually almost had one, uh, g- one actual green on blue uh, situation um, in the middle of a gunfight. Uh, Afghan ally got hit, and uh, the rest of his buddies—I I don't even know what was going on in their heads—but uh, they were kind of like mad at us or something. I don't, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were actually—they actually turned on our uh, officer in charge of our platoon. They were going to shoot him in the back in the middle of a gunfight. We're like, we're taking heavy contact from like twenty-five yards away, tree line to tree line. Um, CS gas, close air support, like all kinds of stuff is going on, and they're going to shoot. They're going to shoot our officer in charge in the back, and uh, luckily the interpreter saw this. Literally tackled the guy in the middle of his gunfight, <clears throat> um, so that way the medic in the OIC could handle, you know, getting a getting a medevac and all that stuff set up. But uh, yeah, it was just it was crazy. We took the guy's gun away, kicked him out of the unit or whatever. But uh, but the, yeah, then like uh, three or four months after we got there, um, uh, they uh, yeah hopped on helos and burned the base to the ground. Never no to, shit. Yeah, never to never to return. <laughs> our, that was it. Our, yeah. See you later. Yeah. Our, our foreign policy is so dumb. Like there there is a lot of benefit to the idea that we peacefully change governments every four years, but there's a lot of drawbacks as well. Like a long term plan, particularly in a war or something like that, 
when priorities and strategy changes from one administration to the next, all it's hard as a fucking as a warrior to accept that that all the stuff you just did now with the new plan is meaningless. Like so, all your friends that died, fucking didn't matter. Yeah, we changed the plan. That's Sorry, not, that's not what we care about anymore. Like all the stuff that you personally went through, it just doesn't matter anymore. That's, that's a difficult thing to accept. So I think that's probably why you left and went into humanitarian work, right? Yeah, I mean that was that was a big that was a big part of it. I mean there was there was two kind of uh, factors that you know really contributed to me leaving. One was during uh, during my deployment in Afghanistan, I just kind of saw the civilians kind of getting caught in the middle of all this, yeah. and I was like, dude, they're like they're the innocent ones here. They didn't do anything. Uh, I saw like little kids kind of caught in the middle. There, there was that one um, you know one instance where Taliban put the, the Taliban put. Um, yeah, uh, um, backpacks with explosives mm-hmm. on them, and sent these two little girls right at me to, to get me to shoot them. Which luckily I, I just was screaming at them and got them to turn around. I was uh, about to shoot them. I actually got uh, chewed out later for not shooting them. But it was just—I mean, that—that that was just—I I couldn't wrap my mind around like that instance, and it was just like, what the like, what the hell just happened? Why did you get chewed out? Well, um, it was—it wasn't—it wasn't, it wasn't a, a massive chew out. It was just more like, hey, dude, you know. Um, you know, it's your call, but in the future, you should probably take that shot because you have people coming at you with with suicide vests or whatever or backpacks. I mean, dude, that's that's not about me just protecting myself. It's about protecting the rest of the guys on my team. And do they put suicide vests on little kids? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. They'll do they'll do literally anything, man. They'll do literally anything. But this yeah. in this case, it was it was backpacks. So the deployment before the one I was on that Matt Hunter was talking about earlier they were in Talifar and they were guarding one one of the missions was to guard uh, electoral locations like people where they were doing the Iraqi elections and they sent an older like a i don't know 30 40 year old woman in with down syndrome holding a baby with an S vest on Jesus walked into Christ. the place and then they clacked it off remotely when she walked into the place mm-hmm. so there's no like that what i was talking about on the fake news recently about mm-hmm. how everybody's all up in arms about how we treat terror suspects and and torturing people that we know are involved in terrorism the idea that we don't we still don't have the moral high ground because of that like get fucked man right you don't you don't mm-hmm. you don't gain the moral high ground because of how you prosecute a war you you gain it because of who you are institutionally mm-hmm. like if you're in any race any gender any sexual orientation any religious belief you can come to america and make your life work without fear of violence for the most part this is a unique country that you're able to do that in and to try to criticize our soldiers and, and, and other warriors and, and the agency and all that shit for how they treat these people who definitely want to end our way of life. When these guys are throwing gay people off of rooftops because they don't agree that with gayness. Yeah. Like, fuck you, buddy. I, if again, I'll, I'll restate this. If any one of my people was on the other side of a door and I had to fucking deal with this human being to get that door open, I would peel their fucking skin off of their body without any hesitation. You can judge me all you want for that. I don't give a shit. Yeah. But that, this is what it is. Mm-hmm. Like, the point of war is to win. Well, yeah, and, and, and also, too, like, to bring up your point, I mean, like, who has the moral high ground? I mean, you, you see a lot of these conflicts, man, and it's so black and white, good versus evil. You know, we don't strap bombs to little girls and send them just to, just to you know, blow themselves up. Right. Or, you know, get shot in the process, and so you... You know, get get a propaganda piece of yeah. you know seals or U.S. soldiers. I don't even want know. to think about how many American service members and uh, contractors and other you know three letter agency assets who have died because they didn't want to hurt a child or a civilian. Mm-hmm. Like guys have hesitated because of children and civilians and lost their lives because of it. That's the moral yeah. high ground right there. Yeah, yeah absolutely, and that's and that's kind of why I was um, I wasn't quite chewed out because I I I'd made the I, I feel like I made the right call. Um, and only my life was in danger just based on the positioning of the of the battlefield at the time. But yeah, absolutely. And I was completely ready, finger on the trigger, putting pressure on it. Um, it's yeah. interesting though yeah. to to hear you say that it was just your life. It's still your life versus these two little kids, right? And yeah. two children you don't know from a country that you clearly probably don't want to be in. And, right? <laughs> yeah, and, no, and it's, I'm it's assuming you're fair. like, dude, I don't want to protect these people. I don't give a fuck about this country or whatever they're going through. But it's interesting that you would do that not knowing these children know. Yeah. Well, you don't know I, their families. You don't know anything about Yeah, I, I hear you on that. And, and I, I get questions about that all the time and especially probably some of the stuff we'll get into later with that rescue the little girl in Iraq and all that. But the, the way that I look at it is, um, I mean, that's, I know it sounds corny, but it's like, hey, that's somebody's daughter. You know, why, why is it, 
why should I care more just because that's my daughter as opposed to it being somebody else's daughter? I mean, that's, that's, that's an innocent child. Um, yeah, I don't know this child. I've never met that kid. I, I don't know their parents. I don't know the situation, but that kid is, is going to, is probably going to die. Either I'm going to kill them or they're going to blow themselves up because of these other guys. Mm-hmm. And if I can wait an extra two seconds, put myself at risk for an extra two seconds and give them the chance of hopefully being able to survive, I, I I'll take that any, any time of day. Um, but what I won't do is I won't put the rest of my team in jeopardy. So it's a, it's, it's kind of a fine line, um, there, but I mean, yeah, it's like, that's, that's, that's a little girl, man. It's like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, yeah. I, I don't know how to explain no, it. I, other I, than, I, than I that. understand. Yeah. That. yeah it was, it's yeah. just, it's interesting to, I don't think we've ever had anybody on the show who said, man, I'm going to put this stranger's life before mine. Well, and, there's uh, a, there's a well, picture of me on Instagram, actually of me holding this little baby and we were in Sodder city. We were doing raids and shit. Then this, like in the middle of a gunfight, this little kid, this like, a two-year-old female child just walks out, and I'm like, "What the fuck, man?" Yeah, yeah. Like, maybe if for all those Iraqi families out there that watch Drinking Bros, I'm sure, yep. there's both of them, both, there's yeah, two both of families. Them. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> maybe, comedy and yeah, comedy. Uh, yeah, yeah, during yeah, a yeah. during a gunfight, maybe pick your kids up and keep them from walking outside. Yeah. Yeah, and that think might, about it. That might be a good. Policy. How many? When he, he was on the show, he was just like, "Man, the the regard though for." <laughs> Life over there yeah. is not what it is here in America. No, it's not. It's, our it's, guy, it's not. Yeah, so it's I, very I picked this kid up, and it was so surreal that my our driver at the time, Matt Morris, uh, another buddy of ours, uh, just like, what the fuck? And he's pulling a camera and took a picture, and I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> like we're in the we're literally mid gunfight, and I'm just standing there, nods flipped up with a fucking two year old. Like, all right, this is Iraq. I no, guess. it's Tuesday. But it's that's the point, though. Like everything stops when there's children involved. Like yeah. gunfights don't stop, but and our. I don't think Iraqis react the same way we do, at least not the people that are fighting, but you can see it. You can see there's a visceral emotion and attached to children with us that isn't necessarily prevalent in other parts of the world, I would say. Yeah. Like life is, is cheap there. There's a lot of people and people die all the time. So they've just gotten used to it. Maybe I don't know what it is, but for us, it becomes problematic when there are children in the battle space and that, <clears throat> brings us to a new point, which is um, no, I don't think anybody knows this is you, but there's everybody knows this video. So there's this video that came out of the news not too long ago, a couple of years maybe. Yeah, 20, 2017. Yeah, when you guys were in Mosul, this was at the height of ISIS when we were dropping bombs on mm-hmm. them and beating them back and all this stuff. <clears throat> Three guys standing behind what I believe was an Abrams. Yeah, one Abrams. Yeah, it's an Abrams. Um, Two guys are providing cover fire, and another guy runs out, grabs a little girl, and runs back. I think everybody's seen it at that point. He's oh yeah, he's one of the guys providing cover fire on that, and then he got shot. What like a couple minutes later? Yeah, a couple minutes after that. Where'd you yeah. so get shot? In the calf. It was, it was small bullet went right through, so it wasn't wasn't a wasn't a major deal. But it's like uh, those those couple of guys, including the tank crew and whomever else was involved, kind of shut down whatever forward progress or even backwards progress, like breaking contact that they were doing. To pull one kid out of the battle space. Yeah. That's I kind mean, of how it works for us. And I feel like mm-hmm. everybody's seen that video. And, you know, I have as well. If you haven't, you, you can pull it up, obviously. But um, uh, the, the the craziest part about it to me is, I, oh, man, again, the situation you guys are in to stop everything around you and just be like, it's almost like calling timeout in dodgeball where you're like, all right, timeout, everybody. We're going to mm-hmm. do this. But there is no timeout from the other side. Yeah, there's yeah, there's no timeout on the on ISIS side for sure. I mean, well, so can you that, describe that story? Yeah, in the, in yeah. That exact well, I mean, the guy, the guy, why? the guy dropped his that weapon happened. because he's like, I'm not going to be shooting like that. You, that that may seem like a obvious thing to you, but for a soldier or a warrior in general to drop their weapon on the battlefield to go do something else is not normal. Like mm-hmm. that, I would feel like I was naked in front of a million people if I was. Even now in general life, when I don't have a gun on me, I don't feel great. Yeah, I mean, and, back then, and by the way, this is not bullshit on the show. Like, Dan, everywhere in life, you have a gun on yeah. you. No matter what, no matter where we go, restaurants, movie yep. theaters, whatever, right? Um, if you don't have it, you're not going, you don't go in there. You're like, right. I got to go back to my car or whatever. Yeah, like, but this is a different kind of situation. This of is course, like, yeah. This is war. Yeah. So it's like this guy 
N- not to suck his dick too much. I mean, because it's like something that I think any reasonable human being should do, but I think we have higher expectations of ourselves than are reasonable sometimes. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of the point. Like, it goes back to that idea that uh, we don't we don't have to fight for the moral high ground anymore. Not that we shouldn't be progressing as much as we can to be bec- more ethical as a as a as a group of people, as a as a country, as a nation, or as a tribe, or whatever you want to call it. But uh, we already won that war. When we decided to leave the eighth century, we won that war. Yeah, and that mm-hmm. was several centuries ago. So fuck off. That whole, <laughs> that whole line of fucking the American leftist media demonizing the actions of people in combat, like get fucked. You have no idea what war is, bitch. You have no goddamn idea what it is. Um, and the fact that you can see, like, you can find more examples of this, of some guy dropping his only means of protection in the most dangerous place on earth. And Mosul in 2017 was the most dangerous place on earth to go save a child's life. Like yeah. find me the Iranian videos of that. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Otherwise shut the fuck up. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Um, who shoots this video? Um, so the Cause, guy- cause I'm always curious where you're like, you know, all the descriptions that everybody's been on the show is like, who has time to shoot a fucking video when all this chaos is going on? Well, that, that's a, that's a great question. Well, one of the guys, uh, who was actually, so there's obviously a fourth guy behind the tank with us, um, is, uh, we call him monkey. He's from Burma. Um, but he, yeah, he, he, he was basically his job with the team I was working with his, his job was basically just to document human rights abuses, things <clears> like that. So he's just walking around with the camera. Um, and what was your job? Doing this, covering fire, basic, just being a medic kind of thing. Yeah, which I wasn't a medic in the teams. I was sniper and JTAC and comms guy. But are you um, wearing a black rifle coffee hat in this picture? I am not. I'm wearing a Patagonia. Oh, you wearing fucking a Patagonia. I know. I know. <laughs> uh, I can't tell because it's turn so far. Back time. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, right. It would have been a great sponsor. This there video has been everywhere. I feel like. Yeah. Um, well, the guy who did that, uh, the African shopping mall, the guy that went in solo mm-hmm. by himself. Was a I think it was an SAS guy. He was wearing a black rifle coffee patch on his the, uh, yeah. the, the black beard patch from Black Rifle Coffee on his shit. The oh, day, nice. the day. Do you remember that? Right, the the guy who went in solo in the mall and like fucking lit. I think he killed eleven people solo, and then yeah. I, I got some people out and shit like that. Was that? It was like a year and a half ago. Was it a video. Yeah, yeah. There's a wow. video of him going into the building, but that's all they saw. Oh yeah, yeah. He kind of goes. In, he kind of comes out like he's like holding some people yeah, yeah. and kind of runs yeah, back yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. I've seen he was that. wearing some black rifle shit, and so everybody sent it in. They yeah, and like, then how his, cool is this? Oh, like, that's like, awesome. No, yeah, no it was shit. Pretty cool that he yeah. saved all those lives. I mean, the patch no, is all no shit. Too, right, but, yeah. No shit. There was over <laughs> ten thousand responses through Black Rifle's customer service portal. Like, yeah. Hey, did you guys see this? Like over ten thousand of them. Oh wow. That's not. They have over a million customers at this point, so that's not that bigger percentage but it's a lot of people it's that saw it and then uh then his command actually before we even reached out to them contacted us like yes that was he was wearing your shit yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> thank you thank you That's uh by the way drink it bros 20 20 percent off at blackriflecoffee.com yeah. Ooh, give them a little shout out but ne- next time you get into a gunfight maybe next time yeah. Yeah. maybe represent just work on it just try to, well, actually, actually, work dude, he's too busy saving there. children dude, to fucking that's actually funny sponsor stuff the, yeah the first time i ever heard about your guys's podcast i was in the middle of burma and i was working with uh this guy and uh what the fuck were you doing in burma by the way training snipers really no not training snipers <laughs> training 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 a rescue team training that, children tra- training, training rescue team um but is that real What's up? What you just said? Yeah, what I said. Yeah, and we can get into that. Okay. In, in a minute, yeah. Okay. Um, but, yeah, so the, he was wearing, he was actually wearing a black rifle uh, mm. coffee shirt, and I started making fun of him, because I was like, dude, like, I, I didn't know the SAS guy wore that. I was like, dude, operators don't wear that, man. Like, that's that's lame. You know, I was just making fun of him. Mm. And he was like, oh, no, dude. He's like, this is awesome. And he started talking about Drinking mm. Bros podcast <clears throat> and everything. So Was this yeah, an American dude? Kind of funny. Uh, American slash, uh, what's, how would you say, Dutch? Dutch, Dutch. Like yeah, Dutch, from Holland? No, not Holland. Denmark. I should, I should know. Danish, Danish. Danish yeah, yeah, yeah. Half American, half Danish, dude. Okay. Um, but yeah, yeah. He's super, super cool. Real good, dude. Um, That's a hundred percent honky right there. Yeah, we've got American, a lot of fans in Northern Europe. A yeah. lot. Like nice. Norway, Switzerland, Sweden, fucking uh, Germany, Holland, Germany. Yeah. All, all those Northern yeah. European states. We have a lot of fuck. I don't know why, because they're all white, probably. Yeah, honkies, dude. <laughs> a honky, a bunch of honkies. honky strong, dude. <laughs> Hashtag honky strong. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, what were you doing in Burma, by the way? Um, so I, I run a nonprofit organization, Stronghold Rescue and Relief, and we operate in Burma, Venezuela, and Colombia. And w- what I what we have uh, in, in in Burma is a rescue team that protects civilians who are basically targeted for extinction by the uh, Burmese government. 
So the Burmese government is going around trying to uh, knock out all these different ethnic minorities. And the full what, on, what are they? Which, what are the ones they're trying to knock out? Um, there's there's the Kareni, the Kachin, the Wa, the Shan, uh, the Rohingya, the Karen. There's a bunch of different uh, tribes that are just in the different uh, on the region. There's there's probably twenty or thirty different tribes. Um, is it kind of like Aborigines or? Like how no, you, no. How, how would you describe it? It's no. more like the Holocaust, where there's a group of people internally in the main group. It actually, a good, uh, uh, a good, and uh, Saddam Hussein in Iraq, they were the religious minority, but mm-hmm. they were trying to wipe out Shia for a long time until they, he decided that, like, well, we got to work with these people, so we'll just dominate them. Stuff like that. And yeah, it's that, like, that's, it's that's a very good analogy more like, for what's going on in Burma. More yeah. like now with Matad al Sadr. Who is trying to wipe out all the Shiite or all the all the Sunni that are in the Shiite controlled areas of Iraq? So it's like they're basically the same people, except for one little piece of information from a thousand years ago. Maybe yeah. you never know. You never know mm-hmm. where people are going to draw these stupid dividing lines. But it's yeah. they're basically the same people. Just like oh, they think this. No, nope. yeah. can't have that. Yeah, it, it's, it's very it's very ethnic over there. So the central Burmese government is the actual ethnic Burmans, mm-hmm. and they can they've controlled I guess the central. Irrawaddy Valley so it's for, like for thousands games. of years, yeah. But but yeah. But then there's all these other tribes that that control the the yeah. borders and they control like that. They lived in the these these uh, highland areas for thousands of years. And it's just when the British left at the end of World War II, they left the Burmese, the ethnic Burmese, in charge and left them all the weapons and left them all the power, which was a huge mistake because uh, the Burmese actually fought for the Japanese. You and mean like sides. you mean like we did in Iraq? Like yeah, like yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, dude, history repeats <laughs> itself. Vietnam yeah. and Korea. Fuck. Uh, the, the, the list goes on and on. We're really good. At Everything yeah. I know about Burma was learned through Rambo. Okay. Um, yeah, similar, similar, um, uh, yeah, like similar are you situation. Weapons? That's what's really going on. Yeah. Are you, are you, are you not, if you're not bringing weapons, you're not changing anything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but but to an extent, I mean, there, I know that's it's over the top, but to an extent, that's actually over the top. Another, another slow, slow movie. movie. Boom. What? Yeah, do you know over that? Over the top is a fucking arm wrestling movie where he was a trucker. Let me turn I this around not... backwards, dude, so you can understand <laughs> me better, dude. Over 20, the he's top 27. He doesn't know. I've never, I haven't seen that, no. Yeah. Oh, you don't still know? No, I don't. You I don't barely, Stallone? I barely don't Stallone. Uh, you alone. <laughs> you just alone a little more. Um, over the Top is one of the greatest movies of all time. It's okay, the, one right. of the worst so is, movies. So is Rambo. <laughs> Every Rambo. I feel like I've seen a clip of it somewhere. Probably. Probably, on, probably a, a GIF or something. A GIF, yeah. A GIF. A G- a GIF. GIF. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jiffy. Yeah. Yeah. So I, everything I know about Burma is from, from Rambo, and it mm-hmm. seems like hell on earth. Yeah, I mean, well, it's a it's a it's a crazy place. Um, everything that you saw portrayed in that movie, um, with the as far as the atrocities being committed, that's absolutely accurate and worse. So it um, is. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Shit. Oh yeah. The, the central government is going out raping, murdering, start you know uh, burning down villages. You know, there are more people. Bonfires, there are more that. human beings total in slavery right now than there ever have been on any point in human history. Over there. Or just Every, in general, like in general, in the, in the world, there's more slave. There are more people who are slaves right now than there ever have been ever in our in human history ever. Fuck. We forget about it because uh, the people don't live here, so we don't care. Yeah. Right. Right. The only slave yeah. I know is Britney Spears. Oh four. I'm a slave for you. And I'm a slave for you. <laughs> is that the one with the diamonds covering her whole Python, body? Python. Yeah. She had the snake around her neck. Uh, Pretty great video. Oh, great nice. video. Okay. Yeah. Um, so how long did you fuck around in Burma? Um, well, I've been going in and out of there for the last few years. Um, I don't want to you married. No, no. Okay. You Cause I was going to say your single. wife no. would be like, Hey man, could you not go to Burma? That'd yeah. Yeah. So that's, I, I, I spent, uh, six months of, uh, 2018 in Burma and spent like probably three or four months there in 2019. So I spent a lot of time over there. So you're training uh, whom? And so, so yeah, what so, are you, what are you training to do exactly? Yeah. So they, uh, the, I work with one specific tribe, which I won't, I won't name, but, what I do is I go in and I'll, I'll bring in a couple other guys with me as well. Mm-hmm. What we do is basically we train um, former soldiers who've lived, like who live there and are part of that tribe. Mm-hmm. And basically we enable them, uh, we we uh, train them how to defend most effectively the uh, the people that are under mm-hmm. attack and <clears throat> give them the supplies and resources they need to do the humanitarian side of things as well. So, for example... Um, earlier, um, not earlier this year, but earlier in 2019, um, there was a situation where the uh, Burmese government was moving towards several villages of civilians, dropping mortars on them, machine gun fire, the whole the whole nine yards. And um, basically, uh, my team went out there and uh, slowed them down, stopped them, so the civilians could get to safety, and uh, actually ended up pushing pushing these guys back to 
farther than where they had started from. Um, so they, they're they're defending these civilians, and they're again they're not going out looking for f- a fight. But if you if you're going to make a move on the civilian population, they'll go in and uh, and and stop them. And they actually prevented two villages from being burned. And is this through? The Navy SEALs, or just through no, your no. foundation? Yeah, so this is through mm-hmm. this is this is through my organization, mm-hmm. uh, Stronghold Rescue and Relief. Yeah, this is this is what we do. So you're out of the military? Yeah, well, yeah, I'm out of the military. Been at 27. Yeah, I was. I got out at I got out at uh, 24. Went to Iraq, did all that craziness, mm-hmm. and then um, yeah, for the last three year, yeah, for the last three years, I've been doing the um, doing the humanitarian thing in war zones um, with yeah, Stronghold. Why do it? Let me ask you that. Um, is it just? I mean, it seems so fucking dangerous, right? And again, for people you don't really know or, or, yeah. or a country that you have no connection to, I've always been curious about this because it's, mm-hmm. it's one of those things where, again, you're just like, you're putting yourself in harm's way all the time for, let's say, it's like Dan says all the time on the show, for uh, wars that have been going on for thousands of years mm-hmm. that <clears throat> we're not going to fucking stop. Or You're, you're absolutely correct. <clears throat> so I, I don't, involve myself in wars i don't fight wars with the mindset of this is the last war ever and we're going to have world peace i don't i don't that that's not the mindset the mindset is there's a child over there who is going to die 100 percent. there's a woman over there who's going to be raped and then murdered there's um men over here whose heads are going to be chopped off after they've watched their families thrown into a fire and burned alive there's children over here who are going to get their legs blown off after the bad guys put in mines in their village and that has nothing to do with a thousand years of history. That's that one person right here, right now. And if I can stop that, mm-hmm. I'm going to stop it. And yes, I, so I was a SEAL, but I'm still, I'm no longer a SEAL, mm-hmm. but I'm still a warrior at heart. And um, this is, it, if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. If I we the, the places where we operate, nobody is there. There's literally nobody there. So we we live in America and we have this huge military that protects us. Mm-hmm. There's a village on the other side of the world where nobody. They have l- less than nobody to help them. And so if I can go in there and help them, then I, then I will. And you know the 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 motto of our uh, organization is that, you know that saying by Edmund Burke: the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. All that I have to do, all that has to happen for this village to be destroyed and all these people to be killed and all these horrible atrocities to happen is for me to sit here and stay safe. That's all, that's all that has to happen for, for that horrible stuff to, to take place. I'm uniquely situated with my background and with the desire and willingness to go do this. So I have, I have no choice but to take action. I wouldn't be able to sleep at night if I didn't take action because I've seen too much. I've seen, I've seen these things and I... I have to, and I, I will and am, dedicating my life to saving as many people as I can because one life is, 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 is worth it, in my opinion. And, w- and what do your loved ones say, your parents, uh, your brothers, sisters? You mm-hmm. know, what do they say of like, hey, man, we love you, mm-hmm. and we want you to stay alive for us. Mm-hmm. They, don't, go, don't go back. <laughs> well, you know what? Actually, you know what's amazing? So my, my... I, I have kids, and the, okay. it's, I have two boys, right? And they could very well go on and do this. Mm-hmm. what you're doing now it would be hard as a parent to say godspeed go and protect people that you have no idea in a world that does not care about you and knows nothing about mm-hmm. us or you know your life and upbringing and all that stuff like yeah th- th- and that's that's a totally fair and uh probably normal response um yeah did your parents l- did your parents have a did they so sit for, down with you? So first of all, my, my parents are extreme, but they were extremely supportive of me being in the military. Um, my mother, she's like, she's my hero. I call her, the, she's like the ultimate Spartan woman. Um, you know, cause my dad went to the military. I was in the military. Uh, my brothers traveled around the world and did a bunch of humanitarian type stuff. So she's used to her, her men, um, being in dangerous places and, and, and helping other people. Okay. Um, but I will say that so about my mom, she has never once, never once ever said, anything more than like, Hey, be careful. Never anything more than that. She's never said like, Hey, don't be a hero. Hey. Um, when I, when I called, when I was a civilian and I called her and told her I was going to Iraq, um, she actually started crying on the phone, just initial reaction. She was like, okay, he's going back into a war zone and you know, in a couple of weeks. Um, but then her response through her tears was literally, you go help those people. That's her response. So that's why I say she's like the, in my mind, she's the ultimate Spartan woman because it's that's that's more difficult to bear to send your family and to send your sons to go into these places 
Um, so they they are extremely supportive. Um, I couldn't I couldn't be more grateful for the family that I have. And um, yeah, so that's they're, incredible because I would imagine if you got some form of pushback, it would make it harder your job harder. Yeah, to an extent, I'm sure it would. But also at the same point too, I'd still go do it because <laughs> it's like this is uh, this is the only thing I'm gonna do. Actually, you know, funny story. So after I got shot. Um, I had uh, I had self coverage in Mosul because mm-hmm. the towers on the east side of the river had been uh, restored power to. So I actually had cell phone coverage, and I was in the because uh, I knew uh, after the mission was over, I realized that there were cameras out, and so I was like, okay, I don't know who's going to post what mm-hmm. to social media, mm-hmm. and I don't want um, I don't want my mom to look on Facebook and see that I've been shot and think that I'm dead for the next three hours until I can contact her. So I call her um, or I text her, I forget. And uh, I say, hey, mom, it's, everything's fine. I'm totally good. Um, but I just got shot in the calf. Without skipping a beat, her initial, her, her first response was, well, at least you didn't get shot in the bull. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, it took me a second. I was like, what? Did, oh, my word, that's hilarious. So that was my mother's response when I w- was hit, you know. And, uh, yeah, so I, I, I couldn't be more grateful for, for, for their support. But, yeah, it probably would be harder, but I'd still go do it because it's like, you know, uh, I'm not going to let someone's opinion stop me from saving a child that's, you know, going to die. Sure. Yeah. Sure. I, what a fascinating woman. Yo, uh, she's awesome. she's hilarious, man. She's yeah, she's she's the best. <laughs> <laughs> what do you have? Do you have brothers, sisters? I have I have one older brother, Zebulon. Another great Jewish what name. What is going on? Yeah, he's like names. 6 foot. I think he's 6'6", six, six, uh skinny. Military? Big, big old red beard. No, never been in the military. No, but did the did the humanitarian thing. Yeah, and they just th- they thought they would give you the most impossible names of all time, and just say, "Hey, good luck." Yeah, yeah, it was just yeah, go, go for with it. God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> go I, live look, your life. It's exactly. not going to be weird at all. This is, a, this is a good point. We we have sponsors uh, that that pay for this whole fucking shit wagon to be on the air. So before we kick back into it, because I want to I want to learn some more about uh, uh, the organization you work for. Yeah, uh, we'll pay the bills here real quick. Uh, first and foremost, ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros twenty five percent off. Everything in the store, mattresses, pillows, sheets, adjustable bases, you name it. They're doing it all for President's Month. Eh, a lot of people say Black History Month. Some people say President's Month, you know? Well, we've had a black president. <laughs> we've now, had a black so. president now, so I feel like we're covering both bases. Yeah. Do it for, for our black president then, you know? Uh, however you want to see it. <laughs> Go to ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros today. And as always, the 36-month pay-as-you-go program is uh, still available with this, which is incredible. So uh, go there. Get wet. Get a fucking bed, dude. Get uh, mattresses, sheets, covers, whatever you need. Uh, Next up, we got the boner pills. GetRoman.com forward slash drinking bros. You ever taken a boner pill? You ever need one? I have not, no. Oh, man. You should. I'm all, I'm all set. I'm up still only 27. So Take it re- recreationally. Recreationally. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. yeah. You see, so, you've never do, taken... do you guys have samples here? Uh, no. We, we oh, did. No. Somebody took them. Yeah. I'm not going to say which guest took the samples, but yeah. um, this dirt bag <laughs> texted us at like 3 a.m. from a hotel with this bloody... It, he had a Rambo boner is what we call it in the biz. <sighs> you know? It, it looked like he'd been through war. Oh, man. And maybe he had. His dick had. Um, but, dude, recreationally, it's a blast. So let's say you don't have erectile dysfunction and you just want to get fucking hard and bone your lady for the weekend. Or if you're a single man like yourself, you know, you meet somebody on Tinder and you're like, look, boom, boom, pop a couple down. <laughs> let's figure shit out before you have to go back to Burma. Because I can't imagine there's a lot of sex going on in Burma. No. No, no. not at all. No. Not at all. Not at all. Got to get it out while you're over here in America. <laughs> go to GetRoman.com forward slash Drinker Bros today. Free doctor visits. Uh, free shipping. It's discreet. Comes right to your house in an unmarked box with your kids, wife, mistress. No one knows except for you. And then, boom, pop one of those guys down. I sit the kids in the neighborhood down and explain what the package is and why I need it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Dan, you also have to register yourself um, as a sex offender because of I'm it. not an offender. No. You're a defender <laughs> of your own body. Go to GetRoman.com <laughs> forward slash Drinking Bros today. Get your boner pills. Last but not least, we've got VinceroWatches.com. I'm wearing one right now. Heavy as shit, this thing is. Uh, affordable watches. V-I-N-C-E-R-O watches.com. Uh, promo code Drinking Bros gets you 15% off and free shipping. Every kind of band you could possibly imagine. Um, and look, it looks like the nicest watches you could never afford in a mall. Now you can. Uh, get one. Strap it up on your wrist. Um, you can go anywhere with these goddamn things. As a man in this life, you need a nice watch. 
uh, to wear out in public for most events. It's what a lot, what a lot of women judge you by. So go to vincerowatches.com, V-I-N-C-E-R-O watches.com today. Promo code Drinking Bros, 15% off. This one's the blue steel. A uh, big fan of it, dude. I, and I wear mine loose. I like to wear it loose. Everybody else is like, you're a dirtbag. And I'm like, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. Uh, VinceroWatches.com, promo code Drinking Bros, 15% off. Tell us about your organization. Um, yeah, so we're called Stronghold Rescue and Relief. And before I continue on, I know I've, you know, we've kind of talked about Burma and some more of the kinetic type things. Yeah. I, make it, I need to make it very clear. Like, we are a humanitarian nonprofit organization. We are not a militia. We're not private contractors. We're not out there looking to get into fights at all. Our, our mission is to help families in war zones. And that does occasionally result in. Um, Gunfire. th- th- gunfights going off, um, no. but th- we're not looking for it. But that's not our that's not our intention at all. So I got to be very clear. Well, about I'm going to show up to one of your places and start a gunfight. Yeah, Dan <laughs> just wants to do well, it. Th- this so. is why I also very rarely take volunteers because that's yeah, <laughs> it's, it's it's bad. Guys are like, yo, dude, like, I want to come. I'm going to hang out with you, and I'm like, no, no, I want to kill again. Yeah, it's like, ex- whoa, no, dude, whoa, I, whoa, whoa, you would not believe the amount of text messages and like direct messages I get on Instagram and Facebook. But pretty much that. Not they don't say oh, that. Yeah. They're like, it's all. I just, I just like really want to make a difference in the world, you know? And it's like, no, dude, you want to go kill people? Like, I, you know? Yeah. Uh, but, which is not what we do. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we're, uh, our, our mission is just basically to help families in war zones. Um, as we've talked about it over a few of these different stories and stuff we've already been mentioning, I mean, the civilian populations that are caught in these different conflicts, they, they, they suffer the most because they don't have a clue what's going on. They don't have weapons like they, they you know, they, and they, they don't have they TV don't have or radio movie. or social media or anything. Or they are they just they wake up and they're like, oh, fuck, somebody's burning down my house. Oh, well, no, lo- no. They, they Everybody knows about this stuff before it happens. But, they do. Okay. But there's no there's nowhere to go. And then a lot of times you do have people. They'll get up and move. Well, now where do you go? Like, OK, so you're in the middle of the jungle. <laughs> there's no refugee. Camp it's not there. like the United States where I if I decided today to move to California, my my money that exists digitally would be there when I got there. Right, right, right. No, they have to pack up like the Beverly goddamn hillbillies, everything mm-hmm. they own in the back of a truck your and chickens drive it and your goats. And yeah. Shit. Yeah. And find it, find a, find a chunk of land somewhere. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's different in each area that we operate into. So as I mentioned, Burma, Venezuela and, um, and Colombia. So in, in Burma, we have a rescue unit that mm-hmm. uh, protects civilians who are under attack and provides humanitarian relief and all that stuff. In Venezuela, we have, uh, basically undercover teams that smuggle in, um, uh, medication, food, different things like that into like the worst areas that are controlled by the gangs and, and the communists and all that. And uh, speaking of Venezuela here, not to, not to cut you off, mm-hmm. uh, only because we get a couple of socialists running um, for president right now. Mm-hmm. How does that work down there, socialism in, in Venezuela? As far, it's... it's uh, is it what, fucking what mean? chaos, man? It looks like chaos. On what, the Venezuela? Yeah. Dude, Venezuela is an absolute hellhole. So what, what, what people don't realize is there... This there, is exactly why I asked this question. Okay, yeah. so there there are more... I'm not, sure if it, I'm not sure if we've crossed the point yet, but I think we're either about to or just did cross the point where there are more refugees fleeing Venezuela than there were that fled Syria. So what's happening are right... Are fucking serious? Yeah, dead serious. And so what's going on? This is on? a rich country, by the way. Venezuela yeah. is yeah. extremely oil Where's the rich. money going? Yeah, yeah. Well, exactly, exactly. It's all going into the. It's all going into fund the the gangs and the and the colectivos, as they call them, the collectives, the mm-hmm. socialists. Um, those are the gangs that prey on the people, and um, yeah, it's the entire thing is an absolute mess. Um, but what's going on there for the people inside the country? People are eating dogs and cats, getting stuff out of out of trash. I mean, and so because of that, there's all these diseases, super, super preventable diseases, mm. um, stuff like worms, um, stuff like fevers, kids are getting infections, and there's no medical care, there's nothing. And actually, actually, if you bring in outside medical care into some of these hospitals, they will, they will, um, ba- they won't execute you right away, but they will throw you in basically their version of a Gestapo prison if they catch you smuggling medicine into a hospital. So with my background in the SEAL teams mm-hmm. and by working with these different guys, we, we do make that happen. Um, and we have incredibly brave people who risk their life literally every single day to deliver medicine to literally people who are going to die if they don't get this medicine. And a lot of this medicine, it's like four bucks. It's like four bucks for like an anti-fever medicine or it's like at 10 bucks for um, 10 American dollars for something to like deworm a child, right? It doesn't cost a lot of money because we buy our stuff down in South America. Um, and, 
obviously we don't have the supply lines and all that stuff. So it makes it so much uh, more efficient. But so that's what we're doing in Venezuela. We have teams that go in and do this stuff. Um, actually, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was and we have to be very careful about what we're doing, because just a couple of weeks ago, the uh, Venezuelan government actually demolished a children's hospital, demolished it because too many um organizations were bringing were like bringing medicine and stuff there but then we're posting about it on social media mm -hmm. um and because of that the venezuelan government got got wind of that figured out which hospital it was and literally demolished it demolished a children's hospital because people were bringing in medicine like that's that's literally what's going on because it makes the government look bad it makes maduro look bad it makes all those guys look bad um so that's kind of what so we're maduro up against. was in on it I don't know if he was in on that specific situation, Look, but yeah, no, whoever's Maduro is yeah. not not in on anything that's happening there. He's responsible. That's for, not how that's not how yeah. those countries work. Mm -hmm. Like if his lieutenants and so on down the line know that if they do something that upsets him, they get killed. So mm -hmm. they don't do shit without knowing for a fact that it's okay with Maduro. That's how that works. So because uh, I was watching the State of the Union um, address the other night, I don't know if you were in the country. Uh, yeah, yeah, I watched Trump. it. Yeah, yeah. and, and they, brought up Guaido. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on that uh, and him specifically? Yeah. So, I mean, Juan Guaido, he's, I, I guess, based on their constitution, he's declared himself as like the interim president. Um, the, the issue is, from what I understand, he doesn't have the backing. He doesn't have enough of the military mm. supporting him to actually be able to do anything. And also, this is an important thing, too, if you want to talk about, you know, Second Amendment rights. I think it was 2012. I want to say it was either 2012 or 20, uh, 2007. Um, they did this, Venezuela did this thing where, where they had everybody turn their guns in. So what everybody did was they all turned their guns in mm -hmm. and the government took those guns, got, uh, they, they pulled a bunch of guys out of prison, gave them the guns and they called them the colectivos basically. So they started this militia using to, to prey on the people using the same guns that the people turned into the government, which is just, it's absolutely asinine. Yeah. Right. And so because of that, the people, the people do not like Maduro, the, the, the resistance, and the the hatred against him is very strong, but there's not enough of the people who are in the military who are who are taking they're not coordinating enough to actually make a huge move um, to actually be able to overthrow him. And even if you do, even if you do overthrow him, it's like okay, it's like Iraq. All right, well, you still have tons of gangs, you still have tons of lawlessness going on. There's all kinds of different guerrilla groups. Just earlier this week, there was a, a Venezuelan slash Colombian guerrilla group that was setting off bombs. You know. A hundred yards away from our our children's refuge in Colombia. So I mean, these and these are guys coming from Venezuela. So the entire place is, it's uh, it's completely falling apart. It's not it's not super simple. Um, I I do appreciate uh, that we are supporting Guaido mm -hmm. and supporting the pro democracy forces, of course. Um, and I, I'm I'm curious to kind of see what the long term. Um, strategy is going to be but as far as like u.s intervention in there that's that, that's not going to work so i've talked with a bunch of venezuelan yeah. ex-venezuelan soldiers and they're like dude if you if the american military shows up in here all of even like the pro-democracy people are going to turn against the americans just because the national pride like where they're not, they will not allow an invader what they see as an invader to come in yeah and it's it's funny and this is the reason why i asked this because uh you know trump made a big deal of of bringing him up in the middle of everyone and thanking him and saying we support you mm -hmm. right and most Amer 99 percent of us i would say civilians at least mm -hmm. you know nothing about what's going on in venezuela right you hear shit and you're like eh, how bad is it uh, but the one thing surprisingly i did here was like that the, the u.s has always been like no nah, we're not getting in that i didn't know why mm -hmm. but now your explanation makes sense of like yeah and i'm sure there's more reasons there the, the cubans and the russians are very heavily involved in what's going on there hezbollah um, is mm. is yeah, uh, they've been using FARC to run money for years now. Yeah, dude, it's it's the, the entire thing is insane. FARC um, is the narco terrorism organization down there. They actually came to an agreement with the Colombian government what two years ago, I think. I'm not sure, something like that. But, but yeah, I mean, but the ELN it, they're, still, they're still running around, yeah, they're still fighting yeah. stuff up. Yeah, I mean, it, so so I've I've mentioned this on previous, particularly on fake news shows and stuff where Hamidi's here, where Hezbollah, particularly the Shia militias, are using. Uh, South American narco terrorism to to basically wash money and get people and money into the United States mm -hmm. for operational reasons. So I mean, like we don't pay enough attention to what's going on down there. I guess is the point of that. Yeah, I, I mean, look, if it is as bad as you say it is, what are we going to do anyways? At that mm -hmm. point, uh, it's weird to say that, but it is. And again, it's even stranger to hear it that you want to go down and help because. Do they look at Americans even helping? Like, hey man, get the uh, fuck out of our country. No, no, they're 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 all for it. So oh, they are. Uh, yeah, okay. no, they're, they're all they for it. They just don't want the, the military to intervene. Yeah, I mean, if, if yeah, if you have 
um, yeah, the 82nd Airborne come, come running down the street. They're not going to be cool with that. But if we had, you know, American advisors, you know, uh, helping with the, like the militia and the defectors, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure that's probably what's going on on some level. I don't know, but I mean, that's, that's a much more realistic situation to kind of help those guys. Um, but yeah, I mean, the whole, the whole thing's an absolute mess. It's not going to be over overnight. I mean, we're going to be dealing with the ramifications of this, especially in South America for at least the next 20, 30 years, because there are millions, literally just millions of people leaving Venezuela. Cause it's like, if you stay in Venezuela, you starve to death. Yeah. So they're flooding into Colombia. They're going into all these other different countries, trying to make their way North, uh, toward America. Um, so they're, they're, yeah, they're, uh, and, and I feel, I feel bad for the people. Cause I'm like, dude, like they're, you're caught in the middle of all this, you know, there's, mm-hmm. and it's not necessarily your fault who I do hold responsible though. And this is the responsibility of every citizen is like the, the people who in 2012, you know, turned in their guns or w- whatever year that was, dude, I mean, you, you can't do that. You just, you just can't do that. You have to take responsibility for yourself in those situations for um, turning in your guns. Well, I'm saying that, yeah, they, they kind of let this happen and you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you need to, you need to deal with these problems before they become a major, major issue. And that's also kind of the mindset with, with stronghold is all of our missions are focused on prevention if possible. Um, Obviously, we can't prevent anything in Venezuela, but we can prevent death, right? So that's what we're doing there. That's our emergency uh, medical supplies and stuff like that. But I mean, like in Burma, it's it's all let's 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 prevent the rape from happening in the first place. Let's instead of feeding, instead of trying to feed you know three hundred refugees whose villages were just destroyed, how about we let them keep their uh, you know, how about we let them keep their villages and yeah. and keep their fields and all that stuff? See, but nobody wants to take action until it's too late because it's so much easier to go over to some place and say, oh, look at this. I bought a truck full of rice and I feel really, really good. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, cool. Well, the people that you're feeding right now, like their home was just destroyed. Half of their family was killed. Mm. That woman may very well have been raped, you know? so This is the same shit we did in Somalia back in the day. 92, when we first got there, we were just like helping the U.N., who had been getting blasted by Ferrar Deeds fucking people for years at that point. And we were just like, it looked good on television for Clinton to be able to send some Rangers and Green Berets over there and Delta guys yeah, to just like hang out, make sure everything's going well, watch the rice shipments go down, but it never really worked like that. Well, no, like then- people like that don't respond to imminent threat. They respond to actual violence. Mm-hmm. Like, it, like for example, they're always an imminent threat. Yeah, they're always yeah. an imminent threat. That's yeah. the problem. So if you go into Iraq and I tell a guy, "Hey, I'm going to kick the shit out of you unless you tell me this information," he's going to look at you like, "Oh, I don't know anything." But if you immediately walk into the room and slap the fuck out of that guy and then start asking him questions, he will answer all your questions because it's for whatever it is. I don't know what the scenario is in their brain. I don't know how the psychology really Just works. Actions over words, maybe. But yeah, they're not afraid of threat anymore. They're only afraid of direct action of what's happening in front of them right now. Which is why when we send a bunch of people over to a place like a surge and then tell them we're going to bring everybody out in 18 months. All the people just wait. They don't give a fuck about us, about us at that point. Like we're not, we're a non-factor in their life. We're a temporary. Mm. And that at that point, which is why it sucks to not be able to tell people when they're coming home. It sucks to not be able to say when a war is going to be over. Once you commit to something like that, you can't say you can't put a fucking a stopwatch on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because it, that, that ruins everything you've done up to that point. Somalia's doing fine today, right? They're the, <laughs> they're great. They're, they're the most libertarian <laughs> country on earth. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and, and to his point too, I mean, American ideology or, or the, the way that way that we think we look at things in terms of, of decades, um, the rest of the world, and especially these very ancient old places, they look at things in terms of centuries mm-hmm. and sometimes even millennium. So, I mean, they're like, my family has literally lived on this mountain for the last, you know, 300 years. Mm-hmm. You know, my tribe has been here for the last 3,000 years. And so anytime an American or with a, somebody with a Western thought process, we're like, oh, let's go in here. Let's let's fix all this stuff. And with force, we'll be out of here and we'll be out of here in 18 months. Yeah. Well, no, it doesn't work like that. And again, they're thinking 100 years. We're thinking 10 years. Their fucking long game is intense, isn't it? Like, yeah. I yeah. mean, it goes forever where it's just mm-hmm. like, God damn it. You'll hold a grudge for 80 years and that motherfucker will clack off. <laughs> well, here's like, the problem. Gotcha. Here's the waited 80 it's years. True, yeah. Here's the problem. We approached the global war on terror like it was a war, but it's not. It's a police effort. Mm-hmm. Like it's something that always has to exist for the rest of humanity. But my question is, is why do we have to police the fucking world? Because we're the strongest. Ugh. We're the richest, well, uh, and we have we have the we we own the moral high ground when it comes to war. And, no and my other question is, says, and like who and who else who else is going to do it? Who else has the resources to do it? I mean, dude, the the, the it sounds dramatic, but like the tides of evil mm-hmm. are crashing everywhere. 
uh, around the world. And the only sort of bastion of freedom is America um, and and, the, and our you know sort of uh, Western allies, Britain, UK, New Zealand, um, Australia. Um, but I mean, dude, like the rest of the world, like it's it's absolute they're chaos content. and madness. They're content to just let it happen. Yeah. Like there's there's something about what the about Western Europe and how it's developed over the last fifteen hundred or so years, where they're just like ah brown people they're come and go, no big deal. And there's something about the way American ideology has evolved and then been propagated throughout all of us that when we look at some starving Somali Somalian child Somalian child. It's not like, oh, that's just Somalia. We're like, oh, fuck, we should go do something about that. Mm-hmm. Like it's a no, different, it's a different right. way we, of thinking about it. So America, yeah. whenever a nat- major global natural disaster happens, yeah, uh, not, not the government, but American private citizens donate more money to that than any other group of people, including mm-hmm. other governments. Yeah, like and then, typically, yeah. and then usually Rihanna will make a song too, and then that makes. Well, I mean, like when Haiti, when the Haiti earthquake, yeah, yeah, when about. the Haiti earthquake <laughs> happened, there yeah. were more private donations from from citizens of the United States than there were money from any other government on Earth. Yeah, no, I get it. I get yeah, it. So it's just like that. that. That's why I get uh, a little tuned up when everybody starts because we fucking hang some terrorist from his toenails in a fucking dark room somewhere. People start questioning our moral obligation to the world get fucked I, same yeah. i never fucking uh, like care about that shit yeah. whenever i hear it i'm like it's a terrorist who gives yeah. a shit how you, you, what, you know what's what weird too to those guys? Uh, what's weird about that too is like i've never actually spoken to someone who who was uh, who was for that it almost seems like people who get upset about that are more it's more like the twitter mob mm-hmm. it's like some faceless person who's outraged by you know let's say you know torture or whatever mm-hmm. it might be but it's i've never actually met another human being <laughs> Who was like, oh yeah, we shouldn't do that. Well, I've, I've had never, the, I've never yeah. actually talked I've had to the conversation a lot. Like, like I where pose, are these people? I pose that same question. Like, there's a door right there. On the other side of that door is your loved one. They're gonna die right now if you don't do something to this human being to get them to tell you how to get on the other side of the door. What are you willing to do? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? And they were like, I would never let it get to that point. Like, well, you don't live in fucking reality, do you? Yeah, it, yeah. Because there's exactly. no legitimate there's no legitimate answer to that question other than two. I I have a line or I don't have a line. Like you either care about your tribesmen, whomever that is, whether it's another woman or a member of your family or a white or black person or a particular religion, whatever the quote unquote tribe is, right? Whatever your group of people that you care the most about is, you're either willing to do anything for them or you have some moral line in the sand. And most people don't know their line in the sand, right? They don't know how far they would actually go. To me, I would go as far as necessary. Same, man. I, like, there's I don't nothing really... that would stop. If I, if I had a child or my, my wife or something like that, I would kill everybody. Same. Yeah. Without mm-hmm. without any regard ask. to the consequences, yeah. 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 What, they did it. Cool. I, you don't even have to tell me if you did right. or not. Yeah. Right. I'll just take your word for it. Yeah. 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 Well, and and, this, and the same thing too. Like with with American ideologies, we believe in the 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 power and the and and the I guess specialness, if that's even a word, um, of of the individual over the group. So it's not we don't just look at okay using the Somali thing. It's like we're not just looking at oh Somalia. It's like we're looking at no. There's like that child in Somalia. Like we have to do something to help that individual. And then the, the individual people, and I think that's what's different about Americans, and what's so wonderful about our country is that we are willing to go en masse to save the one life, because to us, human life is uh, is precious and is meaningful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because you're all over the world doing this crazy shit all the time, right? Mm-hmm. What do you do when you come back to America? Just unwind. Um, to unwind, man. I, I'm actually I'm very much uh, like a like a homebody kind of introvert. Like I I love just kind of reading, mm. hanging out. Um, I, I I write a little bit here and there. Like I when I'm in the states, I'm I'm usually focused on um, you know just fundraising and raising awareness and stuff like that. And um, I've really been doing a push recently. You know, going on podcasts and stuff like that, kind of uh, raising awareness for what we're doing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just it's it's more just a part of my life. I don't really necessarily need to unwind so much because I've just done this so many times, and I'm pretty much yeah. I don't know if you, my, you like go to a Post Malone concert, like you know, <laughs> I've not been to a drink Post a bunch Malone of booze, concert, blackout, yeah. like what, what yeah. you know. Uh, I mean, honestly, my biggest thing is I like to just like when I get out of one of these places. My biggest thing is I just want to spend uh, usually a couple days alone at like a hotel room or something like uh-huh. that and just just like just sleep that's that's usually my thing i know that sounds super lame but like that's i'm I'm always like mentally and emotionally exhausted yeah and i'm usually sleeping on the ground there's always bugs crawling on me kind of thing um and so i'm like i just i just want to like hang out in some in some clean sheets for a With couple days kind of thing. And, yeah and yeah kick back. yeah that's that's pretty much and then i'm and it's just kind of like right back into the grind of uh doing what i do but i also how, love yeah, what how I do, long so. are you 
here for and then versus travel? Um, so it always, it always, um, it's always different. I mean, 2018, I was, I was overseas, I think seven months out of the year, 2019, I was traveling, I think six or seven months as well. So, mm-hmm. I mean, um, I'm trying to cut down on that a little bit. And that's also one of the things that, that we do with stronghold is everything, all of our programs in all three of our countries, it's all about um, enabling the locals to be able to stand on their own because I can't be in 14 places at once. Right. And I'm also not going to spend resources to spend or to send um, a, a Westerner over there to do a job that these other people can do and they can stand on their own. So, I mean, the, the story I was talking about with the, with the Burma situation earlier in 2019 where, you know, these guys uh, protected several villages from being destroyed. Hundreds of people potentially saved their lives. I wasn't there. It was right. the other guys were doing it. And it's awesome. Like, that's that's the way um, that's the way that we operate. And then also, too, because we're a nonprofit organization, every every dollar that comes in, every every uh, um, donor dollar that comes in, man, it's like I want that to go as as far as is humanly possible. Mm-hmm. And so because of that, um, yeah, we're always I'm, I'm, I'm all about enabling the uh, the locals to be able to, to stand on their own. man. And because also at some point, too, man, dude, on my next trip out, I could get shot again. And this time it might actually kill me. Right. And so what happens then? These people now are just have to fend for themselves and and, and, a, and and a big issue that happens with a lot of um, well-intentioned people well-intentioned organizations is what they do is they kind of they, they show up to a place with a, a sort of a pre-packaged idea of what they want to do to help in the situation so it's like oh we we give you know we give teddy bears to kids okay that's great why are you showing up into a war zone giving out teddy bears to children mm-hmm when you, cause you spent thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars on the teddy bear yeah. and you have this team and you have the security team and you have eight volunteers or 10 or 12 or 15 volunteers. Every single one of you spent minimum $2,000 on an air on, on airfare. And then probably another $1,500 mm-hmm. on food, <clears throat> hotels, transportation, dude. So you're looking at 30, 40, $50,000 for a little 10 day trip over there to hand out teddy bears or build a playground. Yeah or hand out t-shirts or whatever it is that you're doing. And again, while that's well-intentioned, dude, that's, that's 30, 40, $50,000 that those kids in the next 10 to over who don't, who didn't get a teddy bear. Yeah. That kid's dying right now because he needs a $10 medicine right. or he needs, or he needs a meal. Right. So that's an, that's I, an I, interesting I, I get, I get way to put it. Yeah. Well, but it's true. That's true. And then like, I mean, it's essentially I, sustainable. I get about it's, it. it's, it's, it's essentially, <laughs> sus- it's sustainable humanitarianism. Like what has the biggest longest impact. lasting impact. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and what doesn't? I mean, it's easy to get headlines with a build a bear, right? Or like, okay, you build a playground somewhere in like a war zone, and but, but doing cholera injections is not very like yeah. no one cares about that shit. Yeah, or giving a kid medicine, <clears throat> it's it, yeah. it doesn't look. You know, he's still sick, so you don't get a big smile yeah. and whatever else, and you can't. You know, a lot of times you can't take in a video camera to, to do it. And so also one of the things that we do with our organization is we ne- my teams are never more than four Westerners. And actually, I've never even had more than three yet, um, three uh, Westerners going over to these places. Because, again, like I was just saying, with the, with, the, with the cost of flights and all this other stuff, it doesn't make any sense to, to spend the money on those things. And I want to um, put all of our time and resources and energy into creating something that, yeah, that is sustainable mm-hmm. humanitarian stuff. And it, but <clears throat> more importantly, I, I call it charity with dignity because they're humans too. And so and they have the same human nature that we have. So every time you get a handout, every time you get something that you didn't work for, I mean, you, you know, you, you feel like a piece of shit. Right. Yeah. And they feel the same way. And there a lot of times there's shame. There's embarrassment. Mm-hmm. You're. Uh, if, you're, if you're working with like a um, you know a, a group of volunteers who used to be in the military, like dude, your your village got overrun, your wife was raped, your kids were killed, right? So you're not only angry, but you also feel shame because you didn't win the fight, you didn't actually win, right? So when we go there, it's no, no, hey man, like we're gonna prop you up, hey, we're gonna help you, and we're gonna help you stand on your own two feet. So we do the whole triple A thing: advise, assist, mm. and accompany. That's basically what we do um, and on all of our humanitarian missions. So. We're going to embed with the locals who advise. We're going to embed with the leaders. We're going to figure out what they need. We're not going to show up with a truck full of whatever we want to do. We're going to say, hey, what do you need? Listen to them. Understand the real situation. Boom. Then we make a plan, and then we assist them. That's where the meat of our work gets done. All right, we're going to assist you. We're going to train you. We're going to bring in, okay, you guys need, might be toothbrushes. And Mm -hmm. that's, for whatever reason, that's just the thing that they really, really need that saves a bunch of lives. And that's not a real example. But, you know, just something like that. Um, and then it's a company. All right. So bad stuff's going down. All right. We're here with you. Like we're, we'll, we'll stand with you and we're not going to run away just cause, um, just cause there's some danger coming here. Like we're going to work with you, but we're going to enable you. Right. Yeah. 
Uh, where can everybody uh, help out or donate or find you online? Yeah, so our organization is strongholdrescue.org. Okay. And um, our, our, our biggest thing, you know, if people want to, you know, get involved and, and help out what we're doing, um, I, I just suggest like, hey, if you're interested in, in helping us, um, 50 cents a day kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a tax tax deductible. Um, and that, that the reason I chose 50 cents a day is because that, that it comes out to $15, which is less than the cost of one meal at one restaurant once a month right <laughs> so it's yeah. like if and and i don't want i don't want um i don't follow the traditional model of um you know where like where i'm trying to like get people to give tons and tons of money i don't want to do that sure um and i'm also not looking for specific individuals to you know uh, to to cover everything and give absurd amounts of money what i want people to do is it say hey you believe in this cause cool well, why don't you give a little bit uh, and make it a part of your budget it should be fun it should be enjoyable it shouldn't be something that you're like you know, oh, well, I, 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 do, I really don't want to give up this money, but, you know, like, oh, I care about the kids. So I'm going to give 100 bucks a month or something. It's like, no, 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 like, calm down. Um, just just give a little bit. And um, if you can do more, great. Yeah. Uh, if you can give a dollar a day, great. Um, but I also want you to be able to give to other organizations, you know. Um, th- this isn't the only cause that's out there. There's a lot of great veteran causes and things like that. And I don't – I want people to – you know, I want people to look at their bud- monthly budget and go, okay, well, I want to give, you know, let's say, you know, 5 or 10% of what I make to, to charity. Okay, cool. Why don't you give a little stronghold and give a little to these other organizations that you believe in. And uh, everybody who's – all of our monthly donors, um, they receive um, – uh, we send them a, 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 a thank you packet with uh, two T-shirts – um, with our with our logo and stuff on, I got some T-shirts for you guys too. By the way, awesome. Um, yeah, and on the back it says the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And I mean, because that's that's what we're all about. And it's all you, you don't have to. You don't have to go do what I do to make a huge difference. It's um, I'm I do what I do because I'm uniquely qualified and situated to do it. And I actually I I actively discourage people from trying to do what I do because a lot you get a lot of the Rambo types that you know they want to go. Um, yeah, you know, they, they just don't have the right mindset and they, again, they mean well, but, um, want to queue. yeah, are they are, yeah, which is not at all our mission at all. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I mean, if everybody just pitches in a little bit, I mean, that, that makes all the difference in the world. And that's how, that's how we do what we do is it's just a bunch of people around the country who each give 15 bucks a month or 30 bucks a month, you know, 50 cents a day, a dollar a day, you know, and, uh, yeah. And then they get to rock their awesome uh, stronghold t-shirts which are they're a real nice athletic fit so. yeah yeah i'm athletic show i off, like show it off your body and if you want to donate to dan and i's <laughs> uh we're at um expensive usa teddy org, and that's we just give mm. teddy bears or, oh wait yeah yeah we're not <laughs> actually so we're not, help, so we're not helping no i make the i make the teddy bear and then send the children a polaroid picture of it <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah but i it's, keep the bear yeah, you keep the bear yeah yeah but the digital image yeah. and that is ingrained in their mind will last a lifetime well maybe last I mean, a lifetime. their lifetimes aren't very long so oh, oh man well then you can Damn. just reuse the teddy bear was that dark yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's messed up. uh now's the point in the show where we get to the drinking bro of the week this is someone who's inspired you or helped you become the person you are today <laughs> i have a feeling you're going to give it to your mom um just based on what oh, we we're talking I, I choose about. who my you drinking. do yeah, oh. yeah yeah it can Thank be you. anyone but Damn, uh, the way you were talking about your mom earlier i was like shit Wish I would ask that question. You're leading later. the witness. Objection. I know. I know. No, that's that's. Uh, I'm thinking. You don't have to give it to your mom. Now, if you don't, um, give you've it given to her him. enough shine. You can give it to somebody else. Yeah, your mom is gonna be. Mad. Oh, you know what? Actually, yeah. Like, I, yeah, I love my mom to death. Uh, my drinking bro of the uh, of the week is my buddy uh, Marcus Mendolia. He actually just passed away um, a couple weeks ago. He's a former uh, SEAL. Um, he passed away uh, in an accident um, back in San Diego. So yeah, love that guy and. Uh, we did. I did two deployments. I did both my deployments with him. Um, so yeah, and then in uh, March, going out to do a uh, memorial service for him and whatnot. So yeah, Mark, my, my boy Marcus Mendolia. That's a great one. Yeah. That's a great one. Uh, cheers, cheers, uh, Mr. Matas. You're uh, an entertaining guy. You got a great radio voice, by the way. Oh well, thank you. Have, is, have people said that before? No, <laughs> oh, it's good. It is. It's they good. say it's, it's real smooth. They, they said he has a face for radio. Yeah, yeah I, I get that one all the not time. Not the same. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very NPR. I like it. I like yeah. it a lot. Um, dude, this was an awesome show, man. Well, thanks Greatly for having me, guys. I really appreciate out. it. Um, and if you can uh, spare a little, um, go go to the organization and, uh, and and fifty cents a day. That's it. Yeah. You know. Boom. 50 cents a day. Tax deductible. Tax Some deductible. awesome t-shirts, man. It is. Yeah. It is. Uh, for and you don't have to worry about Sally Strother showing up and eating all the humanitarian rations like she did in that one South Park episode. Yeah, she's still, <laughs> is she still alive? Or? I don't know. Oh, yeah. man. That's all in the family's cool. not on anymore, so I don't really care if she exists or not. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of forgot about her, you know? I stopped yeah. seeing those commercials. Yeah. Sarah McLaughlin's still alive. She got too large, I think. 
Oh, did she? So they they were wheeling her out in a wheelbarrow after. Like, I heard they started an organization for her wheelbarrow. Yeah. So that's you can donate. Yeah, it's a to nonprofit to, to, <laughs> to drag her fat ass. <laughs> Nobody wins with that. Uh, for Danthony, Danthony Holloway, I'm Ross Patterson. This is the Drinking Bros. Good night, everyone.